The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 54, to the chief musician with stringed instruments, a contemplation of David, when the Ziphites went and said to Saul, Is David not hiding with us? Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your strength. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth, for strangers have risen up against me, and oppressors have sought after my life. They have not set God before them. Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. He will repay my enemies for their evil. Cut them off in your truth. I will freely sacrifice to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me out of all trouble, and my eye has seen its desire upon my enemies. Wonderful. Okay, uh, Judges 16, 23 through 31, Samson, Judge of Israel, Part 9. This is the last Samson sermon, and it's been a wonderful journey with him, and we're going to finish it up today, and I hope you'll enjoy some of the things that come out of this. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to rejoice. And they said, Our god has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. When the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson, that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them. Let me get the page turned here. And they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, yes, about 3,000 men and women on the roof while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow Take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. Then the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of his father Manoah. He had judged Israel 20 years. This sermon was typed on 20 May of 2024. There are various views on what it means to be justified before God. Within those views, people often get caught up in semantics in order to justify their own position on a point of doctrine. In an article by Bob Wilkin, where he argues for free grace, something I am totally in support of, he writes about an opposing doctrine. He says, it seems reasonable to call this process progressive justification. After all, evangelicals already speak of progressive sanctification. If progressive sanctification is necessary to obtain final justification, then progressive justification is another name for progressive sanctification. The Bible doesn't teach that progressive sanctification is needed to obtain final justification. Paul says, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We are sanctified. We are also justified. Paul speaks of justification in a legal sense. That is known as forensic justification. A person is declared righteous because of the merits of Jesus Christ. On the other hand, this is not what James speaks of. In James 2.21, he says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? 
Was that before or after Isaac's birth? Long before. Therefore, he cannot be saying that Abraham had to prove something to be justified. He goes on to say, James 2, our text verse for today, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. James cites Genesis 15, verse 6, saying that God counted it to Abraham for righteousness. He stood justified. So what is the point James is making about his willingness to offer Isaac? He cannot be speaking of forensic justification. Therefore, he must be saying that Abraham, in his state of humanity, is justified by works. If God came to Abraham and asked him to sacrifice his son Zimron, that would be a test of obedience. He had no promises from God concerning that son. If God said to do it, he would either be obedient or disobedient. He would not be justified in his humanity for his disobedience, even if he stood justified by God through the declaration of righteousness. However, God promised Abraham that Isaac would carry on his name. When God asked him to sacrifice Isaac, that was not a test of obedience as much as it was of his faith. The reason for this is that God cannot lie. Therefore, in asking Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, the child of promise, it must be a test of faith that somehow Isaac would still receive the promise. This is verified by Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. How is justification relative to what we will see in the verses about Samson? It is because of who the Philistines picture. They are those who weaken the faith of others or completely steal it from those who have no faith. If a person is told he needs to do something to be saved, if he believes that, his faith is weakened. I'm talking about a saved believer. The same is true if he is told he needs to continue to do something in order to stay saved. God never said to Abraham, if you don't sacrifice Isaac, you are no longer righteous. Abraham's trial was one of faith in his salvation, not for his salvation. If you are saved, you are saved. Don't let anyone weaken your faith. The Philistines are out there. Don't let them rob you of your joy in Christ. It's all to be found in his superior word. And so let us turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I've only got two thoughts for you today. The first is, remember me, I pray. Verse 23, now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And lords Philistines gathered to sacrifice, sacrifice great to Dagon, their God, and to gladness. Because the narrative is condensed, it may seem like this gathering was held because of the capture of Samson. However, it may simply be an annual feast or a sacrifice for some particular event. Because it says to their God and to gladness, it's hard to be dogmatic about any further reason for it. Israel had their annual pilgrim feasts. Other nations had feasts around the equinoxes and solstices and so forth. The rest of this verse, however, seems to tie the feast to their triumph over Samson. Whatever the reason for calling the feast, Dagon, their god, was the center of the worship. Dagon comes from the word dag, fish, which signify abundance. Hence, the word daga means to multiply or to increase. The word dagon refers to cereal crops in general and thus natural abundance. Therefore, dagon can mean fish, increase, or cultivation of natural abundance. Being coastal cities, having a fish as their deity is logical, at least from a human standpoint. The idol representing Dagon was believed to be the upper half of it reflecting a man and the lower half reflecting a fish. 
One Assyrian depiction has a man somewhat wrapped up in a fish with the mouth of the fish looking like one of the pointy hats that the Catholic people wear. And the rest of the fish hung like a garment around the man. Verse 23 continues. Then they said, our God has delivered into our hands, Samson, our enemy. Vayomru Natan Eloheinu beyadenu et shimshon oivenu. And they said, given our God in our hand, Samson, our enemy. As just noted, these words seem to make the reason for the gathering as the victory over Samson. But it may also be that he was the subject of the people's conversation. If so, then it would be that these words here are parenthetical. So I'll read you what it could be. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their God and to rejoice. Parentheses begins, and they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson our enemy. When the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land and the one who multiplied our dead. And then the parentheses ends, and it says, so it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them, and they stationed him between the pillars. This seems like a logical order of how the narrative is structured. However, whatever the flow of the narrative actually is, the people's victory over Samson was a point of conversation, and it was a point of joy. Verse 24, when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Vayiru oto ha'am vayhalu et Elohehem ki amru. And see him, the people, and praise their God, for they said. As noted, the lines seem out of place because only later do the people call for Samson. For this reason, it has been suggested that the words and seize him are speaking of Dagon, not of Samson. However, Samson is the nearest antecedent, and so my suggestion that the lines are parenthetical sufficiently explains the matter. I'm pretty certain of it, but I don't want to be dogmatic. It also fits well with other such instances in the book of Judges where their narrative breaks and then catches up with the chronological events. For example, this was seen at the introduction of Jephthah into the narratives in Judges 11. As for their praises, verse 24 continues. Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. The words form four lines, each ending with the nun vav suffix indicating the word our. The first line also contains its own internal nun vav suffix. Thus, they form a poetic effect. Natan Eloheinu beyadenu et oivenu veet machriv artsenu vaasher hirba et chalalenu. Given our God in our hand, our enemy, and desolating our land, and who multiplied our pierced. It is like a song that people learned and sang together just as people do at rallies and demonstrations all the time. It is intended to easily call to mind the heroic acts of their God. Verse 25, so it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. And is when good their heart and they say, call to Samson and laughs to us. If the previous verses are parenthetical, then this is where the narrative meets up with the earlier narrative. Now the lords of the Philistines gather together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their God and to rejoice. So it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. The two thoughts fit beautifully together. A new word, sahak, is used. It signifies to laugh in either pleasure or derision. In this case, it signifies to have him amuse them. This could be from them deriding him, beating on him, spitting on him, or something like that. It could also mean that they ordered him to do things like dance or bow down and so forth. Whatever it was that made them happy, that is what Samson was called to do. Verse 25 continues. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them, and they stationed him between the pillars. Vayikra le shimshon mi bet ha asirim, vayitzahek 
lifnehem vayamidu oto ben haamudim, and call to Samson from house the bonds, and laughs to their faces, and stands him between the pillars. Here is a similar but different verb for laugh. It's sahak. So you can hear the difference. Sahak and sahak. They're two words very, very similar, but one has a T in our language at the beginning of it. It is the 13th and last time that sahak is used in the Bible. It carries essentially the same meaning as sahak. Interestingly, one word is finished in scripture when the other is just beginning to be used. That is curious to me, and there's a reason which I cannot figure out. The structure of the words in this sentence indicates active performance by Samson. The people demanded that Samson perform for them, probably in dancing or some other activity. The great hero is reduced to embarrassing subjugation and degradation right before their eyes. But it may be that Samson then uses this as a pretext to act as stated in the following words. Verse 26, then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, Vayomer Shimshon el Hanaar Hamachazik Beyado, and says Samson unto the lad, the strengthening in his hand. It is of note that a mere lad is used to guide Samson around. A single youth directs where the once great Samson, who slayed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey, went. And not only is he guided by a youth, but in his blindness he is totally dependent on the lad to identify the place that he desires to go. Now before I go on, imagine being the lad that leads Samson to his own destruction. The little boy's going to go down with the temple as well. That's not in the Bible, but there you go. Verse 26 continues. Let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. The first verbs are imperative and the last is cohortative. Haniach oti vehemmisheni et haamudim asher habet nachon alehem veeshnan alehem. Resting me and I am feeling the pillars which the house support upon them and I will lean upon them. If Samson actively performed for the people, he could pretend to be tired from the efforts. After all, the great champion of Israel lost his power and endurance. In these words is a verb found only here in scripture, yamash, to feel, coming from a primitive root, meaning to touch. Because he is blind, he is asking for the lad to guide his hands so that he can feel the supporting pillars. Verse 27, now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. The New King James Version makes the whole verse seem like one category of people, all on the roof. That is not the intent. Ve'habayit male ha'anashim ve'hanashim ve'shama kol sarnei plishtim. And the house filled the men and the women, and their word, all lords Philistines. In other words, the temple itself was filled with the ruling class, here designated by the plural of the words enosh and isha men and women. These people are within the walls of the temple. And, verse 27 continues, about 3,000 men and women on the roof were watching while Samson performed. Ve'al ha'gag kishloshet alafim ish ve'isha haro'im bishok shimshon. And upon the roof, according to 3,000 man and woman, the seeing in laughing Samson. This is another category, ish and isha, cumulatively numbered with the plural three thousands, and thus they are designated in the singular. Of the number, it is a multiple of three and ten. Three signifies divine perfection. Expanding on that, Bollinger says the following. The number three, therefore, must be taken as the number of divine fullness. It signifies and represents the Holy Spirit as taking of the things of Christ and making them real and solid in our experience. It is only by the Spirit that we realize spiritual things. Without him and his gracious operation, all his surface work, all is what a plain figure is to a solid. Of the number 10, Bollinger says, and you've heard this 10 billion times, completeness of order marking the entire round of anything is, therefore, the ever-present signification of the number 10. It implies that nothing is wanting, that the number and order are perfect, that the whole cycle is complete. With this great number of people standing there enjoying his humiliation, 
Samson has a plan that he is about to execute. Verse 28, then Samson called to the Lord saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God. Samson doesn't merely call out to God, but to the God. Vayikra Shimshon El Yehovah, Vayomar Adonai Yehovah, Zachreni Na Ve Chazkeni Na Ach Hapaam Haze Ha Elohim, and calls Samson unto Yehovah and says, Adonai Yehovah, remember me, I pray, and strengthen me, I pray, surely the beat, the this, the God. When speaking of the true God, the term Elohim or God has been seen 12 times in the Samson series. Of them, six have been preceded by the definite article Ha Elohim or the God. The first five times were in chapter 13 when his parents interacted with the man of the God in verses 13, 6 through 9. This is the only instance by Samson. He first acknowledges him as Adonai Yehovah, or Lord Yehovah. He then acknowledges him before all these people who have thought their God greater than Samson's God as the one true God. He knows that Yehovah is the source of his strength. With the hair again on his head, the Lord is being asked to again acknowledge his status as a Nazarite to God. Verse 28 continues, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. The verb is cohortative. And I am avenging vengeance, one from two, my eyes from Philistines. The meaning cannot be, as most translations read, one vengeance for two eyes. The word nakam, vengeance, is masculine, but the form of the word one, achat, is feminine. The word I, however, is feminine. What he is saying is, I am avenging vengeance for one of my two eyes. Only the God's word translation got the sense, even if it's a bit of a paraphrase. They said, let me get even with the Philistines for at least one of my two eyes. The sense is that his vengeance is hardly compensation for one of his eyes, much less two. Verse 29, and Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Vayupot shimshon et shne amude hatavech asher habayit nachon alehem. Vayisamech alehem. Echad bimino ve echad bismolo. And wrenches, Samson, two pillars, the midst which the house supporting upon them and propped upon them, one in his right and one in his left. Here is a new and rare word, lafat. It signifies to twist, turn, or grasp with a twisting motion, and thus to wrench or wring. It is a verb that gives the sense of sudden and excited motion. It is used in Ruth when Ruth startled Boaz as he slept. It says there, now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, Lafat, he wrenched, and there a woman was lying at his feet. Samson was probably standing there calmly resting against a pillar, maybe with his head down as if he was exhausted, but he suddenly wrenches himself so that he is now directly between the pillars where he props himself into a fully extended position between them and, verse 30, then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Vayomer Shimshon tamot nafshi im plishtim and says, Samson, dies my soul with Philistines. Samson knows that he is at his end, but it is worth his death to destroy the Philistines, the weakeners in the process. In this, they would not be able to afflict Israel as they once had. Verse 30 continues, and he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. Vayit bekoach vayipo habayit al has ranim ve'al kal ha'am asher bo, and stretches in strength and falls the house upon the lords and upon all the people who in it. It is thought impossible that the temple could collapse in this manner with just two pillars being pushed over. However, depending on the construction, which is unknown, and with the weight of 3,000 people on the roof, the act was sufficient to bring it down. 
We can go to Sergio's opening comments on 16 June of 2024 for archaeological evidence of such a temple and its design. Those inside would have been crushed like crimson seedless grapes under the foot of an African elephant. Those on the top would tumble into the falling debris and be broken to pieces like a pile of shortbread cookies in a hydraulic press. What a mess. Verse 30 continues, so the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. Vayiyu hamettim asher hemit bemoto rabim me asher hemit bechayav. And is the dying which killed in his death greater from which killed in his life. Samson's great deeds with his eyes didn't match the great act he brought about without them. By the power of the Lord strengthening him, his final battle was accomplished. Verse 31, And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of his father Manoah. Vayirdu echav vechal bet avihu vayisu oto vayalu vayikbru oto ben tsara u ben eshtao bekever manoach abiv and descend his brothers and all house his father and take him and ascend and buried him between Zora and between eshtao in grave manoah his father. Based on the wording, it appears Manoah and his wife had other children. The term brothers can extend to others within a tribe, but because it mentions brothers and then the extended members of the household of his father, it seems that Samson had actual brothers as well. So she wasn't just barren and had one child, but she had more after that. It's just speculation, though. Either way, they came to Gaza, gathered up his body, and carried him back to be buried in his father's grave. Zora, Tzora in Hebrew means affliction. It comes from either Tzira, a collective word meaning hornets, or Tsa'arat, leprosy. Thus, it literally means either hornets or leprosy. However, both are a type of affliction because the hornet is metaphorically used as an instrument of war driving out enemies. Eshtaol is listed by Strong's under the root Sha'al, meaning to ask or inquire, and thus he defines it as entreaty. However, as we saw in the Judges 13 sermon, Sergio noted that the word Eshtaol, without the vowel points, which were added much later, would say bride of God, wife of God, woman of God, or so forth. Manoah means rest or quiet. Verse 31 finishes with, he had judged Israel 20 years. Vehu Shafat et Yisrael Esrim Shana, and he judged Israel 20 years. This is a general repeat of Judges 15, verse 20, where it said, and he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Of the number 20, Bullinger notes, it is the double of 10 and may in some cases signify concentrated meaning, but its significance seems rather to be connected with the fact that it is one short of 21 which is 21 minus 1, or 20. That is to say, if 21 is threefold 7 and signifies divine 3 completion as regards spiritual perfection, 7, then 20 being one short of 21, it would signify what Dr. Milo Mahan calls expectancy. The Philistines are there working out their evil, ready to rob your joy in Christ. They work the works of their father, the devil, telling you that by works, your soul is priced. But God's gift of life is one of grace. It comes by trusting his word. Only through faith will you see God's face in the radiant glow of Jesus, our Lord. Have faith. Don't be duped by the Philistines. God has done it all through Jesus, our Lord. The devil will try to deceive you through any means. So hold fast to the truth of grace found in the word. Our second thought today is pictures of Christ. Judges 15 revealed to us the work of Christ in atonement and how that allowed for the spirit to come forth. That was the battle with the jawbone of the donkey, lehi, to life and all that. The fountain of the collar was opened and it remained open. The first three verses of chapter 16 detailed Samson's symbolic victory over Gaza. While Israel is in a state of national apostasy, pictured by the harlot, Samson, meaning the place of sun and meaning the word of God in Christ, pulled up the doors of the gate of Gaza. That symbolically represents Christ's completely removing the state 
ability and authority and so forth of the weakeners to afflict God's people through law observance, taking them and placing them before Hebron, the alliance of God in Christ with his people, shows the effectiveness of Christ's power recorded in his word over the weakeners. Remember, if you have the word and you're applying it properly, you are like Samson. That's the idea you should be getting from last week, the first three verses. It is Christ, not the law, that prevails. After that, the account immediately, verse 4, turns to the narrative of the harpy Hellcat Delila, who dwelt in the valley of Sorek. The words Nahal and Sorek together would signify the inheritance of the choice vine. This is a picture of the inheritance of the church which came from the atoning work of Christ. Go back and watch chapter 15 again if you need to, and which bears the power of God in Christ, seen in the short Gaza narrative that opens chapter 16. The name Delilah or Delila means something akin to languisher, debilitator, or so forth. I translated her name as drawer out which would be the cause leading to the effect where she draws out in order to afflict. She is used by the Philistines in an attempt to harm Samson. Their intent is to bind him in order to afflict him. If she prevails, the five lords promise in verse 5, 1100 of silver from each of them. As noted, 1100 is a derivative of 10 and 11. Bollinger says 10 is the number of completeness of order, marking the entire round of anything. Therefore, is the ever-present signification of the number 10. It implies that nothing is wanting, that the number and order are perfect, that the whole cycle is complete. 11 is the number that marks disorder, disorganization, imperfection, and disintegration. If she prevails, she will have come about after a cycle of time which will bring about disorder and so forth. Starting in verse 6, Delilah, the dangerous dragon, begins her series of entreaties. Samson's responses are not true, but each gives hints about what causes God's people to stumble. In verse 7, his first response was, If binding me in seven cords, yeter, fresh, lachim, which not dried, harav, and weakened, and become according to one the man. The cord, yeter, signifies excess, abounding, or preeminence. The words fresh, which not dried, are the opposite of what can hurt. The lachim, or fresh, signifies the time of God's favor. Go to Ezekiel 17, 24, and Luke 23, 31, and you will see that. The word dried, harav, is identical to the spelling of Horeb, the mountain of the law. It was used in the account of Gideon and the fleece in the same manner. Whatever is preeminent is the state of the thing. The dry law will harm, but the fresh gospel will not. This is more certain because the form of the verb harav is horvu, that is identical in spelling to the word harvo, which is his sword. It speaks of the law that only Christ can fulfill. The first attempt failed, so she tried again. In verse 11, his next answer was, If binding, they bind me in ropes, avot, nu, chadash, which not worked, asa, in them, and weakened, and became according to one, the man. Ha-adam, the man. Here, Samson uses the word avot, ropes. They are strands woven together, which are used for binding, drawing, holding, and so forth. For example, Isaiah 5, it says there, in Isaiah 5, 18 and 19, woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as if with a cart rope, avot, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work, ma'ase, from the word asa, to work, that we may see it and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come that we may know it. In this case, however, they're never to have done in them work. They're supposed to be unused ropes. In other words, like the fresh, not dried cords of the previous attempt, it again provides a picture of the opposite. The gospel of the new, the Hadash covenant says, no work. We trust in the grace of Christ. He did the work. Everybody seeing the logic here? That attempt also failed. And so she tried a third time. In verse 13, Samson's next answer was, and says unto her, if weaves seven locks, the machalafa, which is a noun feminine, my head with the warp. 
This time he actually reveals the source of his strength to Delilah, but he doesn't reveal how it is his strength. Samson is the place of the Son, the Word of God in Christ, that is currently revealed in the church of which there are seven individual churches, a noun feminine, noted in Revelation 1, verse 3. They represent the state of all churches of the church age at any given time. In other words, one may be like the church of Laodicea and another like the church at Thyatira. It is ironic that Christ is called the head of the church and the locks on his head are being compared to the seven churches which form the church. Everybody seeing that symbolism? It's pretty clear when you see it. These seven locks, noun feminine, have not been noted until this verse. As his unshaved hair is the connection to the source of his strength, this is sufficient to mirror the other two accounts. Blasting it with the peg, as she did, doesn't change its status. Like the first two attempts, the secret is left undiscovered. In verse 15, Delilah noted his three mockings. It is the number of divine perfection. But Bollinger says further, as we already saw, the number three, therefore, must be taken as the number of divine fullness. It signifies and represents the Holy Spirit as taking of the things of Christ and making them real and solid in our experience. It is only by the Spirit that we realize spiritual things. Without him and his gracious operation, all is surface work, all is what a plain figure is to a solid. Okay, don't look down. What is this picture? Anybody got it yet? Here we go. God's favor is realized in trusting Christ's fulfillment of the old covenant, not in our works. His grace is found woven into the new covenant based on what he has done, not on what we do. And these are then on display in the church. This is the state of the true church since its inception. It has been one of trusting in Christ. However, Delilah continues to harass Samson until his soul was reaped. That's verse 16. Eventually, he blabbed, verse 17, and gave up a secret that the connection was in his hair. It had never been cut. Samson's mother was to participate in the Nazarite vow until his birth. The line leading to Christ brought forth Christ, who brought forth the church. Hair in Scripture consistently symbolizes awareness, especially an awareness of sin. That reflects the state of the church. Using a mora or razor on him means that there will be a change in appearance. The root of it, mur, means to change or exchange. Thus, there will no longer be the awareness of sin. Now, before I go on, think of innumerable churches that we talk about every week on the Prophecy Update that have no awareness of sin. Okay? It is the state of man noted by Paul in Romans 1, verses 18 through 32, where he explains how man suppresses the knowledge of God and no longer has shame or an awareness of sin. That is why the words of verse 17 say, If shaved and departs from me my strength and weakened and become according to all the man, ha-adam. When shaved bald, there is no longer this consciousness of sin. It is the carnal man, the unregenerate Adam, ha-adam, without the spirit. That is why he kept saying, if you do this, 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 I will be like any other man, ha-adam. In verse 19, the Philistine lords brought the silver for payment. The time for the promise of redemption is ending. I would deduce that the rapture of the church fits in at this point. Pay attention because you will too in a minute. This is because Delilah, the debilitator hired by the Philistines, meaning the weakeners, is about to completely remove the consciousness of sin from the church. Just as Paul explained in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, she sleeps him on her knees, meaning she calls to him and he is asleep. And she then shaves away his consciousness of sin as is perfectly described by the sleeping church in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 10. The church is asleep. Right now, it is awake, even if it's falling asleep. There's a point where it will no longer be awake at all. The church is asleep. The place of the word of God in Christ, people that hold to the word of God, is disarmed through afflicting him. And he has not known that Jehovah departed from him. He no longer has the spirit upon him. 
The rapture, the snatching of the church is akin to the grasping and cutting away of the seven locks. Anything left of the church is without the spirit and without the connection to Christ. As such, the true church is gone even if the word of God in Christ remains. This doesn't go anywhere. Verse 21 said that they put out Samson's eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him in bronze and he was grinding wheat in the bonds. For a time, there will be no knowledge of the truth. These people have not been studying the word of God. They've not been paying attention. The church is gone. There's no knowledge of the word of God. So what are they going to do? If they're wise, they're going to go to the word of God. However, immediately, it said in verse 22 that Samson's hair began to sprout. As quickly as his hair was cut off, so also an awareness. Somebody finally woke up of sin began to arise again, just as Revelation shows of the tribulation saints. There's a great multitude. There's so many they can't be numbered. Law observance and bondage are celebrated and will multiply. That's verse 23, symbolized by the Philistines worshiping Dagon, increase. They will celebrate their supposed victory over Samson, the place of the sun, which is the word of God in Christ, while God is building up his believers during the tribulation. The spiritual battle is being described by events of Samson's life, noting that the Philistines call for Samson that he may perform for them anticipates what Daniel says. Daniel 7, 21 through 25, I was watching. And the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The 10 horns are 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the most high, shall persecute the saints of the most high and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. However, there is a time when this persecution will end. The narrative notes 3,000 on the roof. The roof or gog comes from ga'a, to rise up or figuratively to exalt. The time of divine fullness where the whole cycle is complete will come when all those who exalt themselves will be brought down. Understanding this, Samson prepared himself as stated in verses 28 and 29, calling out, I am avenging vengeance, one from two, my eyes from Philistines. The highly unusual wording shows the totally devastating nature of what had taken place. The eye is the channel of information into a person. Jesus said this in Luke 11, no one, when he is lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Samson, place of the sun, is the word of God in Christ. By taking away his eyes, even if one, there was only darkness. How can a lamp that is dark bring light to others? The Philistines, the weakeners, are those who take away the light of Christ. At the time determined by God, that will come to an end. He will, for all intents and purposes, bring the house down around them. The two main pillars of the temple in verse 29 represent the two pillars of end times apostasy, the Antichrist and the false prophet. In bringing them down, the rest of the house of apostasy will collapse with them. The final verse said his brothers and all the house of his father buried him between Zorah and between Eshtaol in grave Manoah, his father. Literally, it would mean between affliction and between entreaty or bride of Christ, in grave rest his father. Samson, the man, he had to die for the sake of the narrative. Ignoring that, these words mean that the place of the word of God in Christ stands between the state of the people waiting to be glorified and the bride of God. 
the dual meaning of eshta'o, which includes entreaty, then looked to the believer's life of affliction while awaiting their final glorification. Rest being in the middle of the two confirms that they possess God's rest as an assurance. Hebrews 4 verse 3 says, we who have believed do enter that rest. We are in our rest right now. We don't have to worry about ever working again because Jesus Christ has done all of the work. We have entered that rest. The seventh day millennium, which follows the tribulation, is a picture of that. God created in six days, followed by his rest. That follows in the 6,000 years awaiting the thousand year reign of Christ, something our closing verse will refer to. Once again, as has been the case time and time again in Judges, we have been shown picture after picture of the contrast between the law and grace. The law is what makes sin possible. In violating the law, there is the imputation of sin. For those who come to Christ, we are told these words by Paul, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. The choice belongs to each person. Will we live in the grace of God that comes through faith in Christ? Or will we try to work our way back to God through our own effort? The weakeners are out there. A spiritual battle is going on all around us. It is insistent and constant. Its mantra is, it can't be that simple. You must earn your way back to God. The world is filled with this notion. Every religion on the planet insists that you must perform. You must do. You cannot trust what God has done in Christ. Unfortunately, much of the church is filled with this same bad doctrine. But what God wants from you is so simple that people just stumble right over it. And that's what Paul calls it, a stumbling block. He calls it faith. Trust him for your salvation and then trust him in your salvation. His word has things you are to do, but they are things that come after you have been saved. Doing the same things before you are saved won't get you one inch closer to God. And because once you are saved, you are in Christ like this, like a force field, doing them after salvation won't get you one closer to him either. Rather, they will be reckoned for rewards or losses. Abraham could have decided to not go up Mount Moriah with Isaac, but he had faith in the sure promises of God. And so he went. Be people of faith, living out your salvation in the ever-increasing knowledge of God in Christ. And that will come by staying in his word. So read it daily. Out of these sermons from Samson, we have thrown away a lot of bad doctrine. A lot of it. Real points of doctrine. The seven churches, hyper-dispensationalism says that doesn't belong to the church age, Revelation 1 through 3. No, that's speaking to the Jews of the end times, right? False. I mean, it's false on the surface. Anybody ought to know that. But this here shows us that that's not true. That here we are living in this dispensation and Samson is prior to the rapture until his hair is cut off, right? And when was it cut off? Pre-tribulation rapture. It's right there. Now there's another picture of the rapture coming up in another sermon. And when you get there, you're going to say, oh yeah, the light came on again. I didn't know any of these things until I started searching out these verses for these sermons. I've read them a million times. I was saying to somebody, Ron, this morning, I read one Samuel like five this morning, uh, three through five, something like that. Maybe it was two through four. Anyway, and I'm reading them and I'm thinking, I've read these 150 or 200 times, and I have no idea what the typology is, and I can't wait to get there and see if we can figure it out together. I have no idea, but this is what we need to do is to check these things out, and once, does anybody see the pictures that I presented to you today? Do you understand them? If you don't, read it again, and it'll come clearer and clearer. It's all right there. The hair, what's that signifying? Why does he lie to her three times? He's giving the opposite, and it's all about grace versus works. It's about you performing or not performing. Who are you going to trust? trust in Jesus. It's all right there. Read it again. Take a look at it. Think about it. I know these things can be complicated, but the more you think about it, you'll say, oh yeah, I get that. It, it fits perfectly. Or closing, oh wait a minute. You need Jesus. Call on Jesus. It's so simple. Believe that he died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who believe will be saved. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what God wants from you.
our closing verse, Isaiah 11, verses 9 and 10. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. The millennium, the people of the world will enter into the rest that was pictured by the six days of creation followed by the seventh day of rest. You notice in the Bible, there's no end of the seventh day. It doesn't say morning and evening was the seventh day. It doesn't say that. It's an eternal day. God is in his rest. Humanity is waiting to get into it. But for those who believe in Jesus now, we have entered our rest. Hebrews 4, 3. Thank God for Jesus. That's why we're not here on Saturday morning. You know what? God worked and then he rested. What do people in Christ do? They rest on the seventh day or the Sunday, which is actually the first day, and then we work. We've already got into our rest. We don't need to do anything. It's done. Next week, Judges 17, 1 through 6. It's a sad story to tell, but we'll get it done. It's entitled, No King in Israel. Part 1. That'll be our 48 Judges sermon. Man, we're getting close to the end. I typed the last one this week, and I'm starting a new book tomorrow. New book of the Bible. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Okay. Translating it has been a nightmare. It's poetic form, and I'm telling you, it is hard to translate. Wow. But it's getting done. I've already got chapter one done. I'm in the middle of chapter two, and I finally said yesterday, about verse 10, I said, I'm, I'm done for today. Okay. Um, Samson, judge of it. Oh, wait a minute. I got a question for you. You don't get anything, but just shout it out if you get it. <laughs> Who was the priest Hannah brought Samuel to live with? Eli. Eli. Yeah, he got it. Eli, the high priest. I read that this morning. You said it? Okay, good, good job for you. I read that this morning. It was two through four. That's right. That's what I read this morning. Eli. Good job. What does Eli mean? Come on, L. God. The I is possessive, my God. Eli, Eli, my God. Okay. That's why on the cross Jesus said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There you go. It all fits. Everything works. When you know it, it just, wow. Okay. Samson, judge of Israel, part nine. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God is delivered into our hands, Samson, our enemy. Everyone, raise your voice. When the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, our God has delivered our enemies into our hands, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. And now, here he stands. So it happened when their hearts were merry, that they said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. How sad and grim. So they called for Samson from the prison and he performed for them and they between the pillars stationed him. Then Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them while here I stand. Now the temple was full of men and women and the lords of the Philistines were there. A big gathering had formed about 3000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. And then Samson called to the Lord saying, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray. May your spirit arise. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once. O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, of which it would soon be bereft. And he braced himself against them, and one on his right, and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might as if urged on by a midwife. And the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it so that the dead that he killed at his death were more than he killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him certainly with many tears between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of his father Manoah he had judged Israel 20 years. Lord God, turn our hearts to be obedient to your word. Give us wisdom to be ever faithful to you. May we carefully heed each thing we have heard. Yes, Lord God, may our hearts be faithful and true. And we shall be content and satisfied in you alone. 
We will follow you as we sing our songs of praise. Hallelujah to you, to us your path you have shown. Hallelujah, we shall sing to you for all of our days. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, how wonderful it is to see the pictures of the future coming alive, even from thousands of years in the past. It shows us that you have control over everything that's going on. No matter what happens in our lives, no matter what distress we face, no matter who we may lose in our lives, we know that you have a plan that is being worked out. And if they are in Christ, we will see them again. Lord God, it doesn't matter who wins the election ultimately because it is your plan that will be effected. And we have our part in that, but you know already what's going to happen. And so we leave that in your hands as well. These things are within your control. They're within your knowledge and everything is coming to its conclusion through your wisdom and through your guiding hand. So we trust that. We thank you and we know that it's true. We can look at the past and see the future and know that it's true. Thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is the master of time and who has presented himself to Manoah and his wife. He has presented himself to Joshua and he has come forward and he has died on a cross for our sins. And someday we will present ourselves before him. Thank you for this promise that we possess because of Jesus. Thank you, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Think of that. Cutting off the hair, church is gone. And the whole world has lost the knowledge of God, all of it. But slowly, it grows back because people say, well, obviously we were the wrong ones. We missed the boat, but we're going to check out the source. It's all right there. It's all right there in the words. Everything that is coming in the future is right there in the words. It's so astonishing. That's what's so heartbreaking that people go and play church. <laughs> they play church instead of worshiping the Lord God who is deserving of all of our respect, our honor, our obedience. People play church. Or they just ignore it. They don't go to church. They don't care. Well, they're going to care someday. They're going to care someday. I don't know when that's coming, but it's coming. It's right there in picture, and it's also right there explicit in the New Testament. We're without excuse if we go and play church. Let's not do that. Read your Bible every day. Praise the Lord for his goodness. When you screw up like I do every single day and a lot, tell the Lord. Just talk to him about it. Talk to him about it. He knows our failings. He knows everything that we're going to do and everything we have done. We can't hide anything from him, so just talk to him about it. We get the instruction for the Lord's Supper comes directly from Scripture. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. and says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And he would have blessed, he would have said, Baruch ata Adonai Luhenu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now think about that. He brings forth bread from the earth. Jesus was blessing this. He's saying, this is my body, knowing that he was going to die the next day. But he would come out of the grave. He knew it. And when he tells you, you're going to come out of the grave someday, he's coming to get you, it's going to happen. I mean, he didn't just say this, just, you know, go through all these motions to say, I'm, I'm kidding. He did this because he loves you. He loves all people on this planet, and those who come to him will be favored. He did this. He really did this. In the same manner, he also took a cup after supper, and he would have blessed us as well. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu, melech haolam, borei peri agafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body.
the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Come on up. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Okay, you got to make way. There's somebody coming behind you. Somebody important. <laughs> I only get to hold her a little bit before she's out of here again. So you come up here. You can stand with her if you want. I get to hold my little girl. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. You can make all the noise you want. You're going nowhere. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Oh, you got the hiccups. Hiccup, hiccup, hiccup. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Up. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Oh, pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Boy, she got the hiccups. My goodness. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Hello, Sweet, sweet, sweet. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Hello. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Boo. No, it didn't work. I had a teacher in fourth grade who scared him out. Oh, yeah. I still haven't gotten over The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. I know. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. She's got it. She's got it. She's got the hiccups. Oh, me, oh, my. Oh, me, oh, my. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. She needs pounding out the upside. She does. Mm -hmm. She needs a lot of it too. Fill that little tummy up. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> she is the star of the show here. Oh my! She, yeah, she's got big. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And there, not just got another one. There, it'll be gone soon. I hope. Poor little thing. I hate it. Man, they're annoying. Yeah, very annoying. So good to have you guys here. So, so wonderful. All right. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Hey, Mabel's back. Mabel's back. <laughs> She's a little sweetie pie. <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, what are you? Who are you staring at? Oh, somebody's hiding. Somebody's hiding. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. She's wondering, what is this guy doing? He's hiding. First, oh, thank you. Oh, good. 31. Okay. I do that from time to time. Damn okay, it. Just an extra, like, I can't find it. About uh, uh, thank you. I got to get that corrected. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Sweet, 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 sweet. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. There's mommy. There's mommy. There's mommy. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Mom is misplaced. Oh no! Okay. Oh no! Just to keep it Okay. You what? She got it. She got it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, let's see here. I had something to tell y'all, and I don't remember what it was. Um, I know it's so hard. It is. Okay, well, here it is. This is this is the encouragement for the day, right here. 
This is little Charlie visiting Sarasota again. My little sweet, sweet, sweet. Yeah, she's a sweet one. Okay, well, I guess we'll close in prayer and go ahead. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the chance to come into your presence, to share in the Lord's table, remembering Christ's sacrifice. He died so that we can live. Thank you for the life eternal that is promised through his shed blood. Lord, you're so good to us. I pray for each person here and everybody that is online that they'll have a great week ahead. And if anybody comes to this sermon in the future and doesn't know Jesus or is stuck in law observance or is being afflicted by the weakeners, that they would uh, redirect. They would come to Christ and they would be saved through his precious blood. Lord, we all pray this. This is what we want for a church is to get the word out. We thank you, we praise you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.